Okay. So my I lost my voice. So we'll see how long I I, I hold up. If, if, if I fade out a little earlier than usual, I apologize. <coughs> Something hit me yesterday. Um, <coughs> Page 798, the portion of Shlach. Shlach, the essence of this, of the Torah portion, is one of the more enigmatic parshas of the Torah. The theme of the parsha <clears throat> that takes up the majority of the parsha is one of the most is one of the most famous stories of the Torah, but it's one of the least understood stories of the Torah, and it raises a lot many more questions than the Torah seemingly gives answers to. But <clears throat> one of the themes that we try to talk about themes in different parts of the parsha is what's, I think what's, what jumps out, what's, it's really an amazing idea, and that's something maybe we're, we're going to get into it now, is how it, the land of Israel, from the Torah's perspective, is not just a inanimate piece of land, a, a geography that just sits in the part of the world, like all the parts of the world. God treats the land of Israel like a being with feelings and emotion. The land of Israel, Eretz Israel of the Torah, <clears throat> is not just a place. It's, it's a living, breathing entity that gets offended, that gets insulted, and the very first Rashi, Kluza Sin Rashi quotes a Medrash, that tells us, why, why does the beginning of this Torah portion begin with a story? So the story that this Torah portion begins, which occupies the central theme of it, is that the Jewish people went to Moshe, and the Torah tells us, tells it to us really in short story form, but it begins that Hashem tells Moshe, Shlach Lechanashim, send for yourself people, which means if it's up to you. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But it seems that the natural way <clears throat> before they were going to go into the land, a new place, was they wanted to send scouts. They wanted to send a scouting party. In Israel, called the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, and the Jewish people were, to were knew that they're going to have to take it. No one's giving them the land of Israel, even though it had been promised to them. It was told it was an inheritance, it was a gift, it was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to their descendants. One of the one of the puzzling ideas of how God gave us the land of Israel was that He didn't really give it to us. He told us about it and he says, Go fight for it and go get it. And so From the language of the opening of the, of, the, of the story, it seems that God was none, none too pleased that they decided to send spies or scouts to tour the land to see what it is they were going. Because in essence, the question here is, were they, were they, were they spying on the land to see whether what's the best way to enter or whether they should go there or not? And since the idea was that God said, this is your destiny, this is where you're going. The mere suggestion that we may not want to go there was seen as a, a, a great sacrilege, so to speak. But shlach lecha, doesn't say shlach anashim, shlach lecha, God's telling Moshe, send for yourself, which means I'm not commanding you to do it. I'm not telling you, you should, I'm not telling you it's a good thing. But if you want to do it, do it. But Moshe picks 12 of the most celebrated and exalted people. He didn't, he didn't pick low lives, he picked leaders of the tribes, and they were all tzaddikim, they were all righteous people. Rashi writes that they were all, they were all tzaddikim, they weren't uh, deficient spiritually. But Rashi begins, the, 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 his comment is, why does this story immediately follow the story of the end of last week's Torah portion, which is the story of Miriam? 
and Aaron, how they speak about Moshe and his, Moshe's wife, Tzipporah, and God is very upset, and he's, he's, you know, the end of the story is that Miriam gets stricken with Tzarat, and Moshe has to plead to God to heal her, and the entire Jewish nation waits for an entire week until Miriam is healed and she can rejoin the, the, uh, the community. And in essence, we, what, what was Miriam's sin? Miriam's sin was that she spoke Lashon Hara, she spoke evil speech against Moshe and Moshe's wife. And so Rashi says, do you know what the connection between last week and this week is? That the Jewish people did not learn a lesson, and they spoke Lashon Hara about the land of Israel. Now, Lashon Hara, when you speak something negative about a human being, somebody gets offended, it has an impact. When you say something, when you say, uh, the Negev could be a little nicer, or Tel Aviv wasn't up to par, who, who are you insulting exactly? Who's, whose feelings get hurt, right? But the Torah, that Rashi says that, that the land of Israel's feelings were compromised by, they came back and he said something negative about the land of Israel. The physical land was Lashon Hara was spoken about. And so they, since they did not, they saw what happened to Miriam. Now, the fact that the Talmud suggests that the people should have understood that, this, that just like you can't insult people, you can't insult Soil is not something that we would take for granted, but this is what the Talmud says, that they should have understood the implications by speaking negatively about the land of Israel. The land of Israel is so unique and so special that it has a mind, it has a soul, it has a heart, and we have to treat the land of Israel the way we would treat ourselves. Okay. But in the story itself, the story is that Moshe sends them and it seems that Moshe had, was apprehensive to begin with. Moshe was nervous about doing this. So why he, why he went through with this is not clear from the literal story. So I'm gonna share with you the, the, the theme in the opening story. He's, he chooses them, he tells them to go. And at the same time, one of the 12 that he sends is his most trusted assistant, his most trusted student, Yehoshua, right, Joshua, who eventually succeeded him and was the one who took the Jewish people in the land of Israel. So he sends, it was such an important mission that he took Yehoshua, the same Yehoshua who the Torah says never left his teacher, his master's side his entire life, yet Moshe sends him for 40 days away. But then Moshe does something curious. At that time his name was not, his name was not Yehoshua, his name was Hosea. Hosea was his name. And Moshe changes his name from Hosea to Yehoshua. This is what the Torah says in verse number 15, 16, that Moshe changes, he Moshe called Hosea, son of Nun, Joshua. This is where Joshua becomes a Jewish name, Yehoshua. His name was Hosea. Actually, Hosea is a Jewish name. It's a Hosea, one of the famous prophets, is a prophet, Hosea. But Yehoshua is a different name. What was the, well, why did Moshe change his name and add an extra vowel, a Y, to Yehoshua, or, or a constant in Hebrew, the word Yehoshua. So Rashi says that, that Moshe prayed, he, what, the, the letter that he adds to Hosea is a Yud, right? It's the extra letter that changes Hosea to Yehoshua as one letter is a Yud. Yud, with an abbreviation, is God's name, right? Which you, if you just write a Yud with an abbreviation mark, it's a shortened form for writing God's name. And so Rashi writes that Moshe prayed I'm putting God's name in front of your name, Hosea, with a yud in front, that God should protect you, God should save you, don't get corrupted by the plan of what these spies are about to do. So the question obviously is, then why did Moshe send them? Right? If Moshe would knew that something is up, then what are you sending them for? And if Moshe felt that he, he by praying for Joshua, that Joshua's gonna be okay, pray for everybody, change all 12 of their names, Give them, an, give them something. Why, why is he playing favoritism only with one person? Well, Moshe, Moshe's okay as long as Joshua doesn't get corrupted, but the other 11 come back, everything's gonna be okay. But what's obvious here is that Moshe was fairly uncertain about what the result of this episode was going to be at the very outset, and yet he goes along with it. 
In the story itself, Ramban, one of the most famous commentaries of the Torah, Ramban, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Nachman, famous Spanish 12th, 11th century rabbi, writes that this whole story actually doesn't make any sense. He, he doesn't understand why this became one of the seminal stories in Jewish history. What happens is, is that they go, and Moshe gives them very, he gives them very specific instructions. If you look in verse number 18, Moshe tells them, go and look at the land. See how is it, and the people that dwell in it, are they strong, are they weak? Is it few, is it numerous? And then he continues, verse number 19, what kind of cities do they live in? Are they open or are they fortified? If they're open, it would suggest that they're very strong. They have no reason to build fortifications. Fortified cities are an indication that the people who live behind the walls are scared. That's why they build fortifications. So if you see fortified cities, Moshe says it would mean that they don't trust, they don't rely on their own power to defend. If they live in open cities, they, they have nothing to fear because they are strong people. So he's giving them all these clues what to look for. And it says Moshe, Moshe is guiding them, Moshe is the master spy. By guiding them, these are, what, these are 12 rabbis he's sending. Who's he sending? He's not sending, you know, uh, he's not sending 12 James Bonds. He's sending 12 rabbis, leaders of, spiritual leaders of tribes, Yehoshua, Kalev. I mean, who, what do they know about spy, right? So Moshe's telling them, gives them very, very specific instructions what I want you to look for and report back to me. And he continues, and because it's obvious that he doesn't rely on them to understand what to look for themselves. In verse 20, he says, look at the produce of the land. Is it a fertile land? Is it a lean land? Is there hunger going on there? And Moshe tells them, he's chazaktim in Hebrew, be strong. Bring back some samples of the fruit. Moshe told them that when you bring it back to me, by, by me taking a look at the, uh, at, at the DNA of the land, I'll get a good feeling about what, what's going on there. Right? Bring me back some fruit. And that, those days that they went through were the season of the first ripe grapes. And so they, off they go. And the Torah describes how they go from place to place. And they come, they come, they went through the south. They come, from, they come up from the Negev. The way they went was they were going north, south to north, up the Negev. And uh, for all of you who are familiar with Israeli geography, so they come up from the Negev and they first hit Hebron before they come, they pass by Jerusalem, right? They come to Hebron. And Hebron, there are giants living in Hebron from the time that Abraham was there, right? Um, for many of you may recall that one of the reasons why the place that Abraham and Sarah are buried is called Me'arat HaMachpelah in Hebron. It's called the tomb. We, we call the two, in Israel it's called the tomb of the patriarchs. But literally speaking, Ma'arat HaMachpelah means the double cave. Machpelah from the word Kefel. And the, our tradition, Rashi quotes two traditions why the place that Abraham is buried, Abraham and Sarah are buried, is because there are, one opinion is that there are couples buried there. So Abraham and Sarah are buried there. Isaac and Rebekah are buried there. Yaakov and Leah are buried there. So there are three couples in the tradition that Adam and Eve were buried there too. One of the reasons why Adam, why Abraham wanted for Sarah, was tradition that's where Adam and Eve were buried. So according to this tradition, there are four famous couples buried in Maratha Machpelah. So it's a, it's a cave of literally couples, right? Machpelah. The other tradition that Rashi brings that it's a, it's a two-level cave. It's a it's a cave with a with another layer on top of it, and so. The, the, uh, the, the Torah relates back in, in the portion of Chayesar in Genesis about the giants who were living in that area. Achiman, Shesha, Tam, the Torah lists them by their names. They were children of the ancient giants who lived in Hebron. And so they come, they come through Hebron and, they, and they, uh, they come and they cut some of the produce that Moshe tells them. And they name a place called Nachal Eshkol because of the Eshkol of the, because of what they cut, the cluster of grapes that they cut in that area. And by Yesuba Mokmashino, he talks about how two people had to carry it on a, on a rod. So big, so huge, 
were the fruits that were growing in the land of Israel abnormally big, that one person had to carry one pomegranate, two people, a cluster of grapes, 12 people came back, burdened, each one was carrying one thing, that's how big these fruits were, okay? They come back after 40 days, and they gather everyone, and they show them the fruit of the land, and they tell, we came to the land, and verse 27, it says, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, and this is the fruit, right? So they, they, begin, their, they begin their report by saying, we went, here are some samples of what happened, and it's a beautiful land, it's a, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. But there are strong people who live there. And we saw giants there. And so eventually Kalev quite, it seems like the Jewish people got very agitated. Kalev tries to calm them down and says, don't worry, I was there too. You have nothing to worry about. We will certainly, Kalev was one of, was, was one of the 12 as well. He was a representative, one of the 12 represented, representatives. He was actually a brother-in-law, Kalev, was the husband of Miriam, and he says, he says, what are you talking about? We've overcome far worse. There's, there's, there's nothing in Israel that we haven't seen before, from Egypt to Amalek, and to all the things that happened in the desert, nothing to worry about, and if God wants us to get it, we're gonna get it. What are you, what's, what's, what, what are you, you're afraid that God's gonna run out of miracles? And, but everybody begins to cry and says, this is it, we, we've hit the max, and they begin to cry that night. And that night, the 40 days after they come back, it's the middle of the summer, so they went in summertime. The night they come back on the 40th day is the day of Tisha B'Av. Right? Tisha B'Av, years later, would become the day that both temples in Israel were destroyed. And so the Talmud explains that originally that was that night that God was... God was uh, chagrined at that crying. What are you crying about? And so the Talmud quotes a very, very, um, an ancient tradition that's very, very, it's, bless you, uh, quotes a tradition that's very foreboding. It says that God says, now tonight you're crying for nothing. You're crying for non nonsense. What are you crying about? But because you're crying tonight, tonight, this night will be for future generations, a night for crying for the ages. And that's how Tisha B'Av was planted in Jewish history, that it became a day designated of, of crime. And all the most tragic experiences of the Jewish people throughout our history have happened or begun or are connected to that night of Tisha B'Av. This is the story. Ramban asks, as many, many of the other commentaries, is what exactly happened and why does God get so angry? So as the result of this, God swears that the entire generation who are between the ages of 20 and 60 will not go to the land of Israel. And they're gonna be penalized for 40 years, one day, one year for every single day that you were in Israel plotting your devious plot to remain in the desert. You're gonna spend an extra year in the desert. And your children, that the excuse you gave, the reason why you don't wanna go into the land of Israel is because your children will be slaughtered and they're gonna be orphans and, right? and that they're gonna be captured and made into slaves. God says, your children who you were so concerned about, they're the ones, they'll go into Israel, don't worry about them. You're not, your kids will. From all of the things that happened over 40 years, and there were numerous things, there's no question that this episode is the most catastrophic and had the biggest impact on the history of the Jewish people. Even the worshiping of the golden calf wasn't as bad. This story kept them in the desert for 40 years and it changed the, the course of Jewish history. And the commentators are puzzled, what happened? Moshe sent them, he told them what to do. When you send a person on a mission, what did, what did Moshe want them to do, come back and lie? Moshe asked them to come and tell them exactly what they saw. They did exactly what they were told to do. They came back, they brought, from, from when you read the words, or the, when you read the story, the narrative of the Torah, they bring the samples and they say, there are strong people living there. Were the strong people living there? Absolutely. Were the giants there? Yes, there were giants there. They do not say anything, there's not one lie 
in their, in, their, in, in their telling of what they saw. And yet they're vilified and demonized in Jewish history for becoming, for being wicked people and, tell, and convincing the Jewish people that the land of Israel is not meant for us and that we should stay where we are. And what happened? I mean, if you were sent, if you were sent on a mission, Moshe tells you, come back and tell me, are there strong people or are there weak, weak people? Is it, a, is it a lean land? Is it a fertile land? Are there fortified cities or there open cities? Moshe wanted to know exactly what they were facing. So they come back and they say exactly what's going on there. So he, it's, it's strange that for, for coming back and doing what they were told to do, they're punished, and not just punished, punished to a very, very high degree. So numerous answers are given, right? The classic commentaries give numerous answers. For thousands of years, every commentary from the, from the very beginning of time have all struggled with this story. And there are a number of suggestions have been put forth in various forms. Um, many of them are intertwined um, amongst numerous commentaries, but generally, the, the, generally one of the themes that many of the commentaries talk about it was it's not what they said, it's how they said it, number one. And Moshe never asked them to give, Moshe told said, come back with the facts, which they did. But they did one thing after that. They started to give an opinion about whether or not we should continue into our journey. Moshe never told them that when you come back, give me your opinion, give me your military opinion about how or not whether we should go into the land of Israel. So after they finished giving the report, they should have shut their mouth. You did your job. But they said, Lo nucha la'alot verse 31 is a key verse. The people who went there said, we cannot go up. We will not be able to overcome those people. For it is too strong for us. The, the people who live in Israel are too strong for what we were able to see. All right? And in verse 33, ver, ver, sorry, in verse 32, it says that they brought forth the evil report in the land, that they spied out, saying, the land through which we have passed is spied out is a land that devours its inhabitants. What is that? Whatever, what is that? What do you mean a land that devours its inhabitants? It eats up it's the people who live there, okay. And all the people that we saw there were huge. So it seems like the Jewish people were vertically challenged even back then. They were the average were four foot eight. And they came to a land that people were giants. And uh, because I think, I think, I think we, it's, it's European genetics, but certainly it, it seems that the Jewish people were on average much shorter than the people they were encountering in that land and that they were intimidated. And they go on in verse 33 to say that there we saw the Nephilim and giants. We were like grasshoppers in our eyes and so we were in their eyes. We felt like we were, we were, we were tiny, they like a step on us. So here, the commentaries point out is that they went from being fact finders to becoming generals and, this, and telling the people that based upon our, our uh, ordeal for the past 40 days, there is no way that we're going to succeed there because we're nothing. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes, they're going to squash us. This, many of the commentators suggest, is, one of the, is, is what the problem was. But then again, so that because it's only natural when you ask someone to report that they're going to give you their feelings. I mean, and, you know, it's funny. In, in, in Genesis, we read a similar story where Pharaoh has a dream and he calls Yosef. You know the famous story where Joseph interprets the dream? The story, the, the dream of seven fat cows and seven skinny cows. And so Joseph has this amazing interpretation that the fat cows are fat years, right? Good years of produce. The seven lean cows means it's going to be a famine, right? And Pharaoh is so amazed with this interpretation, even though, you know, if you ask, put 10 people in a room and you ask them, if you see fat cows, what does that mean? It means they have a lot of food to eat. If you see skinny cows, it means they're starving, right? It's not, a, it's, it's not it's, you don't have to be necessarily a Joseph to figure out that dream. What was Pharaoh so amazed about? But Joseph goes on, 
He doesn't stop. He says, I have a suggestion for Pharaoh. In the seven good years, why don't you build huge storehouses and collect a lot of food and put it away so when the seven lean years come, you'll have what to eat. Wow. Pharaoh's even more blown away now. Not only is this guy a genius that he knows seven fat cows mean seven good years, but he knows that if you think of hunger is coming, you know what you should do? You shouldn't eat it all right away. Put some aside for the, for the, right? And he says, Joseph, I never met any as brilliant as you, the spirit of God. I'm going to make you my second in command and you're going to be in charge of this operation. Joseph becomes Joseph, the second in command, because he had the amazing foresight to know to build a closet in his basement and put away some food there for the good, for the, when the bad years are coming. So, over there also, the, many of the commentaries ask, where did Joseph get the chutzpah to tell Pharaoh what to do? First of all, what he told them is common sense, obviously. But Pharaoh didn't ask Joseph to give him advice. He told him to interpret my dream. Joseph had the temerity to keep on going and say, Pharaoh, I have some, you know, I have some advice how you can overcome this. Pharaoh has, he had a whole chamber of commerce, and Department of Agriculture, he had people on top of it. And this guy's telling him, he's telling Pharaoh what to do. But Pharaoh was so amazed that Joseph was giving him advice. So in other words, the comments suggest that when you see something, the Torah is telling us that when you see a problem that God reveals to you, God revealed to Joseph as well, the solution to the problem. I'm not gonna get into tonight why that's so amazing because it's something that most of us probably could have figured out as well. When we see, that's it for a different week. But here, the people are being punished for coming to a conclusion that is only natural. If I tell you to go scout this and come back and give me a report, and you come back and there are giants there, and you feel intimidated, and you're scared, so you're gonna come back and you're gonna share, right, even though you were told, you know, as they say, just the facts, ma'am, but still, it's, it's, it's a normal byproduct to, to say, people ask you, so what's your opinion, what do you think? Well, based on what we saw, it doesn't look good, right? So, what's going on here? Why, why, are they, why do they go from being tzaddikim to being villains? And that's a, which is what Rashi writes. Rashi writes that these people were wicked people. But it says... If you look at verse number three, the number says, at that time, they were, at that time, they were kosher, they were good people. They went from being distinguishable to being wicked people. So, And again, this remains a very puzzling story. It's a puzzling story that Moshe, on one hand, was nervous about this endeavor. He felt it wasn't good, and he sends them anyway. He changes Yehoshua's name because he felt he sensed that something bad was going to happen. But yet, he disregards his own intuition, sends them anyway. He gives them very specific instructions what to do. They do fill it to the, to the letter, and then they give the add-on one verse in the sense that based on what we saw, we don't see a natural way forward. And because of that, it's disaster strikes. That's right, but is it mentioned in this portion that it's uh, Tisha B'Av, or this is commentary? So, <clears throat> the verse says, that that they cried that night, Balayla. What does it mean that night? Why is it her emphasizing they cried on that night? Let me see if there's a. Yeah, if you look at the note on page 803, 
where it says, we see where it says 14, where it says national, national hysteria. So in that first note, in the second paragraph, which is the tragedy, it says the people wept that night. God declared they indulged in weeping without a cause. I will establish this night for them as a time of weeping. That night was Tisha B'Av, the day when both temples were destroyed and many other tragedies took place throughout Jewish history. And he quotes from Rashi. Rashi, Rashi quotes this, that, that the fact that the Torah emphasized, that it doesn't say by Yifku'am, Yifku'am Balayla Hahu, for only for one night. Balayla Hahu is like that night, very, a very specific, they cried for one night. What was that night? Right, she says it's, it's an infamous night. When, you know, when it says Hahu, that, it's, it's called the definitive, the definitive article you say, that night. And Rashi, Rashi quotes the Talmud that that night refers to only one night. And it's the night of crying. Okay. So one of the, I told you that, so, so there are many, many commentaries that span several thousands of years. That everyone weighs in on the story and everyone gives, maybe highlights and suggests what went wrong here, what's going on, why is it so it was terrible. This story, the story next week, the portion of Korach, which is the, this portion of next week talks about re, the great rebellion that happened that started with Moshe's own family, Moshe's cousin, Korach, right, instigates a rebellion to try to overthrow Moshe and Aaron, which also has disastrous results. And so these stories that bookend one another, um, if sometimes without, without engaging in a more spiritualized idea, and that's why when you study Torah, I've, I've mentioned many, many times, Torah, Torah has to be understood and is understood on many levels. There's Shivim Panim, right? There's more than 70 faces. Torah has a Pshat, it has a literal interpretation. It has a mystical interpretation. It has, there's, there are layers and layers. And what's, what's special about it is, is that they're not mutually exclusive. They're all, you have, as the Talmud famously says, Elu ve'elu divrei lukim chayim. Right, the Talmud famously says in the Tractate of Erevin that you can have two opinions, but they're both true. Torah, Torah, you know, when you have when you have a disagreement between people or disagreement of facts, you know, it could have only happened one way. But Torah doesn't work that way. Torah has Torah has is multidimensional, and that is that a story could have happened a specific way. But it can be true that on numerous levels there are a number of things happening. And, and while it's hard sometimes for our uh, physical mind to wrap itself around were they thinking this or were they thinking that? What, which one was it? The Talmud, the Talmud says both. It's right? They, they were all, everything was true. They were all happening at the same time. And especially with these people who Rashi calls distinguished giants, and the Torah calls distinguished people, it's obvious that there were things that are happening that are both on a conscious level and a subconscious level. So we can, the way we, under, we would understand it is there are many times in life that we do things that we can have good intentions or that something bad happens. We can have bad intentions and something good happens. Or we can have, an, we can have a conscious and a subconscious intent at the same time. And sometimes we do something because we think this is the reason why I want to do it. And then later on we find out that there was something else. There was a mysterious impulse that was pushing me that I didn't feel or know at the time. And so I was, I was acting it on a purely subconscious layer. And so many of these, what Kabbalah is saying is that we have to recognize that these are prototypes, these stories are prototypes that represent soul, great souls, that we each have to find ourselves in these stories. Mm -hmm. And the reason why the Torah tells us these stories is because what's also unique in, in the realm of literature, right, it's very rare that the origins of what we would call the, the uh, foundational pieces of literature will discuss in such detail the mishaps and the negativity of the founders of that religion or of <coughs> the legends or the myths that always seek to, you know, to mythologize itself by only the good parts, right? You, you don't find in other religions that, that, that they would talk about all the mistakes that Muhammad made, or all the slip-ups of Jesus, right? And yet the Torah is a book, we call it the five books of Moses, and 
the Torah does not necessarily always, always put Moshe in a very favorable light. Moshe is, is, is Moshe is yelled at. Moshe gets God gets angry at him. Moshe is punished several numerous times. Aaron is punished. All the great all the great leaders Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah they all struggle. It's a, it's, a, it's a book of struggle. That that they're, that they're 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 you're, they're human beings. They're great spirits, but they live lives of great struggle. And if Moshe was the one, you know, one, it's one of the great arguments that, that of the authenticity of our book is that Moshe, if Moshe had, if, if Moshe was anything who other than who he was, he would have taken a lot of white out to a lot of these stories. And nobody would have known the difference because if you're the author of your book, right, you can choose to decide what to include and what to keep out of your memoir. And yet Moshe, as a faithful servant and a humble servant of God, he dictates word for word what God tells him to write to a fault to the sense that he's, he, that he, 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 Moshe comes across as a very, very tormented leader in this, especially in the last week's Torah portion, this week's Torah portion, Moshe keeps telling God, I can't do it anymore. Take this job away from me. I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a nursing mother. He goes, when God tells him to provide food, he goes, what am I, a nurse that's going to support, feed all these people? And Moshe tells God, if this is how it's going to be, kill me now. Kill me. Right? Who talks like that? Right? What great, what, what, what you know, talk about Moshe, the, the, greatest of, the greatest leader ever. So Moshe, he loses himself a number of times. And God has to literally pick him up off the ground and encourage him to keep on going. Don't worry. I'm with you. But it's, it's so real. You know, you, it's real that we read about these people and you recognize that the Torah does not mythologize, sensationalize. It, it tells us that these were people who accomplished great things, but they were people, so we can relate to them. We can't relate to people who always succeed, who are always happy, who never fail, who are always healthy, and everything turns out at the end, and who always walk, right, who always, you know, they walk on water, and everything turns out, you know, it doesn't work that way in Torah. They fall down, they get up, they fall down, and they get up. And yet, what we're, we're asked to, to find ourselves in these stories, because the stories of the idea of Torah is that it's an eternal lesson for us. We're not here to read history. The Torah, who knows how many other stories happened in 40 years? You think we know every story? 40 years is a long time with 7 million people. The, the Torah picks and chooses stories. So why does the Torah just choose to tell some stories and omit other stories? So Rambam points out that all these stories that are, have eternal lessons for all future generations that have import or impact for all time, that's the stories that were included. There were many important things that happened, but if, it, if, it, if there wasn't something that's going to be impactful or a lesson to be had for all future generations who are learning Torah afterwards, it wasn't included in the Torah. Because the Torah means only one thing. Hora'ah, it means it's a guide, it's a lesson. So what is the lesson? So if there's a lesson to be had, this is why we're studying it. If it's only history, it's great. Every, everybody has history books. We don't, we don't have reverence for history. History is studied to understand what it is that God wants from us today. So, Rosh Hashanah of Dadi, the, the, he, he, actually the, the founder of the Chabad movement, and Rosh Hashanah Zaman, who wrote the Tanya, who lived in the late, late 1700s, he wrote a commentary on the Torah called Likute Torah. It's a very thick, but it's a Kabbalistic interpretation. So he, he encounters all the stories, but he creates, he finds he finds a thread that is very, very unique, that re-examines uh, these stories. And the, common, the commonality in most of, of, his, of the examination, the way, he, the way he thinks, is something you find that, that was continued in a few generations by all of the successors, and that is, every story has a redeeming quality to it. The fact that the Torah is telling us that we, we can look at these people and we say, listen, and it's a natural thing that sometimes when you read a story and you say, hmm, I wonder how, how I would have reacted in that story, in that situation. Imagine had you lived at that time. You ever wonder you lived in that time? And you lived through this most momentous time in history. And you witness manna falling from heaven every morning. You witness the sea splitting for you. You witness the giving of the Torah of Mount Sinai. 
nothing's impossible anymore because miracle, you've seen nature change and you see, you've seen God reveal himself. You've seen the, the most amazing miracles that the world's ever witnessed with your own eyes. And you say to yourself, would I have complained for watermelon? Would I have, would I have, would I have nudged Moshe? I mean, would I have been part of a rebellion against Moshe when I myself saw that God chose Moshe to give Moshe the Ten Commandments? He didn't give it to me, right? He didn't give it to, he didn't give it to Jack down the street. He gave he, Moshe, right? So you say, you have to have some kind of gumption to, to go and complain and to rebel and to have this lack of faith all this time, living in a time when you didn't need to have that much faith. For thousands of years, Jews had to have faith in a God that never spoke to them openly, never made a miracle for them. And yet these people who live, these people who lived with such present miracles seem to display an amazing lack of faith, an amazing lack of willpower, amazing, it's just, and you say, how can it be? And so his approach is, or Shnezama's approach is that we have to understand that there's always this element of a story that we don't get. And we have to dig a little deeper. If we dig a little deeper, well, in the sense that there's a story that the Torah is not giving to us right away, we have to search for it. So, one of the, so I'm going to share with you the, the, the basis of, 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 of this insight. And it, it'll continue into next week, so I'll, I'm not going to spend so much time on it because it relates to both of these Torah portions and actually a few Torah portions going forward. So he starts, with the, he starts with the notion that if the Torah calls them, if Moshe sent them, and the Torah calls them distinguished, they're above, they're above reproach. Moshe wouldn't have sent them otherwise. So his thesis is as follows. He says, these people, that entire generation, never had to work after they left Egypt for, the, for day after day. There was no work to do in the desert. What did they do a whole day? That's just a, what did the Jews do a whole day in the desert? They studied. They studied with Moshe, they studied Torah. What, what were they, think about, think about what, what, is, what is the day-to-day existence in the desert? The, the Torah describes later on how their clothing grew with them, it, that, that God laundered their clothing, that they had their food dropped at their doorstep. They didn't have any worries. There was no, they had no health issues. Nothing, there was no issues going on. Every single day, what did they do? They went to Moshe and they studied the Torah. Moshe was their... Moshe was their teacher. Moshe was their rabbi. Now Moshe tells them, guess what, guys? I'm sending you to on a mission to the land of Israel. The question is why? What can be better than what we have now? What's a, what, why are we running from where we are now? What's better? So they come to the land of Israel, and they see that it's a land that they're going to have to conquer. The issue was not so much what kind of people were there because Egypt had a far more superior army than what, was going, what, what they were facing in Israel. Egypt was the superpower of its time. So the question that they were facing is, we're gonna give up an idealized existence in the desert where we don't have to work, food comes easy, God makes miracles for us, every day the cloud disperses the sand in the desert for us, they were sheltered, it was a cool 67 degrees in the, in, in the, uh, in the bubble. There was no heat. There was no, it wasn't, there was no frost. Everything was perfect. And, and what do you do? You study Torah. What other purpose, if the greatest purpose is to connect to God, how do you connect to God? Through studying God's word, God's wisdom, which is the Torah. No distractions. No bills, right? So the idea is, is if or if the intent is for us to study as much Torah as possible, 
then what, what other environment is it going to be better than the environment we are in right now? We have the world's greatest rabbi, and we have all the, the comforts, and we have all the, everything that we need living in a bubble. They knew that when they go to the land of Israel, as it eventually happened, after the 40 years of war, fast 40 now, the month stopped after they came to the land of Israel. They had to put together an army. It took 14 years to get the land of Israel settled. They immediately, the land did not start sprouting food. They had to work the land, they had to till the land, they had to plant. And the life of a farmer, it sounds great when you, you know, when you, when you read about it in books. Farming is hard work, right? It's early mornings, late nights, and it doesn't, and you're not, it's not always successful. And so the concern was, and, I, I'm, not, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you his idea, and then we're going to go through the verses, and you see how he, how he finds it in the actual wording of the Torah. He says, it's a land that's counterproductive to spirituality. Israel is not going to make us grow. It's actually going to make us more coarse. It's going to make us more secular. You don't go to Israel to become religious, they claim. That's what he writes. He writes this 250 years ago. He says, you, you don't go to Israel to find religion. You find religion outside, right? Before you go to Israel. It's in the desert, by being away from Israel, that's where you're going to find religion. Because in Israel, you're going to become overwhelmed with being, wanting to be a nation like all the other nations. You're going to become obsessed with being a nation state. And you're going to want to look, you're to look around, you're going to say, hey, we have to have a monarch, we have to have a president, we have to have a prime minister, we need a, we need a Knesset, we need to be a, a nation. Nation building, right, does not necessarily go according to the accordance of Torah. And that happened as well. We know throughout the, 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 the history of the Jewish people that they wanted to fashion themselves to be one of the other nations that they were surrounded by. They wanted to be, they wanted to be one of the UN. They came, to, they came to Samuel. We read the story in the book of Shmuel. It says they come to Samuel. You know, after Moshe, the Jewish people never had that they never had, you know, imperial monarchs or prime ministers or people with executive power. The Jewish people were, were led by spiritual leaders, by rabbis, by people who taught them Torah and taught them God's word. God is the law, right? This went on after Moshe was Yahushua, and then there was, there, there, was the, the, there was there were Nevi, there were prophets, there were judges called Shoftim, Devorah, Barak ben Avinoam, Ehud, right? Shimshon Hagibar, Shimshon was a judge. Right? They were, the, the judges were the spiritual teachers of the Jewish people. They were the bet that if you wanted, to, if you had a question, the leaders of the Jewish people, there was no, there was no executive, uh, centralized military leader. It was wrapped into the spiritual leader of the Jewish people at that time. There comes a point where the people come to Shmuel, who was the leading prophet of his time, and it says, to Nalanu Melech, we want to have a king like all the other nations around us. They were intimidated because the Philistines, and the Amalekites and all the other nations that they were around had a strong military leader, a general with an army. And the Jewish people said, you know, you know who our leader is? A rabbi. How inferior, how, is it, what? how inferior can we be? We gotta got be like the Joneses. We, we need, we need, a, we need, a, we need a... And Shmuel goes to God and he says, well, what do we do? And God is aghast at the request of the Jewish people. Because this is what they had left behind, behind that idealized version of the desert, that, that we are a nation of spiritual seekers, a nation that God says that our, our strength does not come from military might, it comes from truth and from being connected to God. So God says, what do you want? You want to be like everybody else? The whole point of taking you out of Egypt, bringing you to the Sinai, giving you the Torah, is so you not to be like everybody else, right? So, you, I, so so what happens, Israel becomes the excuse to be a nation like everybody else. There's a lot of theology, I mean, the, the rabbis were writing this 250 years ago. You have to understand also the, the time, the climate they were writing, and he writes again. There was a massive wave of immigration going into Israel. It was the beginning of the Enlightenment movement. And people who were looking to Israel to say that, that if only we had a place to call our own, our condition, the Jewish condition would be different. People were, were very reticent to go because the land of Israel was, is not, 
if you don't if you don't go in the right frame of mind, not only is it not conducive to growing spiritually, it has the opposite effect. This is what these people, the spies who were giants, were concerned about. They said, "What's going to happen when we go into Israel? We're going to lose everything that we have now. We're going to lose Moses. We're going to lose the fact that Torah is central to our lives, and we're going to have to become business people and farmers." And then we're going to have to get involved with politicians and nation building. And, and, the, and what do we gain? What's, what's the upshot? What's the point? In other words, he writes, the deviousness of the spies was not that they were afraid of the, prow- the military prowess of what was going on in Israel. They actually ca- they colluded amongst themselves and they said that we're going to convince the Jewish people to stay in the desert because... Life here is better. It's more idealistic. There's also an undercurrent here, and that is that since they knew that Moshe was not going to the land of Israel, they, I mentioned this last week, they were looking for a way to save him. It is a tribute to the great love that they had for Moshe, he writes, that they were willing to come back and sacrifice the entire journey, the entire sense of mission that it was given them, and to create a situation on the ground to scare the Jewish people, to frighten them to the point that they would not want to go, and then they get to remain and keep, keep Moshe with them. So the, the language that they use, in I told you, it says, it says that it's a land that devours its inhabitants. What does it mean it's a land that devours? Remember, that, that it's the, the language that the spies used, Eretz Ochelet Yoshveha. It's a land that eats up the people who live there. How does a land eat up people who live there? And, and what do they mean by that? Is that even true? What was it, a people sucking uh, land? Sinkholes. Sinkholes? <laughs> but, huh? It's so hard. But then, but they don't, but they, if but the they, ideal situation but, sorry, is in the yeah. desert, then why God wants the Jewish people in Israel? Right. But they, they I'll, we'll get to that. But they, but they begin, it can't be that they were disparaging the physical part of the land because the first thing they say about the land is, Eretz Zavad Chalav Udvash. It says that we came to the land, and the land flowing with Makanari. It's a beautiful land. They weren't disparaging the physical part of the land. It devours their time. Their, their time would be devoured. It certainly seems that that's the meaning of it, but, right? So he writes that what, what Kabbalah says that Eretz, the earth, it eats up the people. Why? Because the people who live there are consumed with materialism. Mm-hmm. So what, what does it mean that the land swallows you up? You become so consumed with the land, right, that you obsess over it, and the land becomes your God. The land of Israel becomes your substitute, right, for spirituality, for God. You, you begin to worship, and so aside from the fact that you are so, right, your time, but it's literally, as they said, it's a land that swallows you up in the sense that you become a part of the land. You're an Israeli, right? We're Jewish. We're Jews who live in Israel because God gave us that land. But the idea that our, our identity is that the land of Israel, it comes it's first and foremost, that it, it eats, it swallows you up, and that we are, that's, that's all we're, we're consumed with. That becomes, and for many people, that becomes their substitute for Torah. That, that, that affinity with the culture and the land, that, that's, it swallows them up because that, for them that's enough. And so he writes that they came back and they told, they told the people, do we want to be Jews or do you want to be Israelis? Do you want to be, pe- you want to be people that the land's going to swallow up and spit you out in the sense that all you'll be consumed with day in, day in, day out is transforming that land? Or should we stay where we are and just keep and become and remain the people of the book. So Tal asks if that's the case, then sounds sounds pretty logical. Then what then so what's wrong with that? Sounds like what's wrong with that? What does God want them to go to Israel for? So the answer is is that God gave us God gave the Jewish people a very complicated mission. The mission is that God does not want us to remain in a cocoon 
God wants us to inhabit a land and transform a physical land into a spiritual place. God wants us to take the land of Israel, by extension the entire world, but God wanted the land of Israel to be the prototype where people look at that land and they see a spiritualized version of what the whole world, what the whole universe can actually be. A physical world that's obsessed with right, that's obsessed with holiness, that's inundated with spirituality, that we take who we are as human beings, part spiritual, part physical, and showing that the land of Israel, like I, as, as I began tonight with, the land of Israel is not an inanimate piece, it's not an object, it's not a place. It's a being, it's a, right? That we can transfer, it has a soul. And that the, by showing that by the, the best version of who we are, that we are a people whose souls, our spirituality, direct our physicality, that yes, we have physical wants, but Torah, by the same token, this was, this was the revolution of the Hasidic movement over the Musar, right? The, the Musar movement, of which Roshner Islam himself is the prototype of. For, for hundreds and even thousands of years, the idea was that by, that the way that a human being becomes a perfect version of oneself, you know, there is through physical denial, whether it's fasting or medic or, or, um, inflicting sleeping at a minimum and or denying yourself basic physical desire that's how you become more spiritual so you ask somebody how do you become spiritual right well if you, if you focus on physical sensory if you focus on physical desire impulse control right you learn to highlight right and to strengthen your spiritual mate your, your spiritual your body responds to your spirit rather than vice versa so the Musra movement, which, was a, which is the classic pre ananta Hasidic movement was, that if you want to get someone to change and become better, what do you do? You, 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 they, they, they would spend hours every single day focusing on how corrupt people are, a human being can be, how selfish we are, how bad we are, that we're negative, that we think negative thoughts most of the time, that most of our impulses are bad, right? And so they would beat themselves with self-flagellation. And the idea was that if you, if, you, if you put yourself down enough, right, and, and you focus on the limitation and what's going to happen, as uh, Akavya, Akavya ben Mahalalo said, famously said, in chapter, beginning of chapter 3 in Pirkei Avot, he says, if you never want to sin in life, if you want to stay away from sin, he says, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an easy way. He says, he starts Think about three things when you wake up in the morning. He says, "This is the, this is the uh, I would say the bedrock of the whole Musar movement in a nutshell." He says, "If you want to stay away from anything negative or sinful thoughts or sinful actions in your life, just meditate on three things: May Ayin Bata, where you come from, Ul Anata Holech, and where you're going, Belif Nei Miata Atid Litendin VeChashbon, and who you're going to have to give an accounting." For between the time that you're where you came from and where you're going, and then he explains. He says, "Ma'ayim He goes, I'll, I'll, "I'll be graphic with you." He writes, "You know where you come from, mitipasucha. Sit down in the morning, put on the window shades, and analyze and meditate for just a few seconds. Who are you? What is it? What is a human being? You know where you come from?" He says, "Tipasucha. You come from a putrid, smelly drop of semen. That's where you come from. Think about your where, where your you know what your origin is. Your origin." Is something that's that that is it's it's a it's something that the word srucha means it's in a sense spoiled, right? It's a decomposing material. He says, this is, "And where are you going?" It, 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 this does not go well with uh, raisin bran crunch in the morning. Don't think you know. Where are you, where are you going? Limkom afar rimavatolea. He says, "You come from a smelly." putrid drop, and you know where you're going to end up? A place that's filled with worms, maggots, right? All of us come from decompo de decomposing seed, and we end up decomposing with worms and maggots eating, our, eating us. That's what he says. And who are you going to have to talk about what happened between the, between the time you were a smelly putrid drop and the time that you were being devoured by maggots? 
God himself is going to say, okay, now explain to me how someone who came from where he came from and who's ending it up, who's right now being decomposing from, the, from a decomposing drop, explain to me, where did you get off in life thinking so proud of yourself? Where did you, you get away with feeling good about yourself? What did you do in, what did you do in your life that you're so proud of? You were a nobody, you came from nothing. And you're ending up in the most, uh, and if you have yet to imagine, the most ignominious ending for a human being, right? We're ending up in the earth, right? Eaten, eaten away. He says, if you want to, he says, if you want to stay away from ever thinking anything constructive about yourself, or becoming proud, because he says all sinful thoughts begin with pride, that I'm important, my life is important, I'm somebody, right? And my self-worth, right? It's a, it's a the whole idea of a Western, it's a Western idea to be proud of who you are and to assert yourself and rights. And like Havim Malal shrugs it all off. He says, nope, you're nothing. You're worthless. You're worth less than worthless. You come from, you, 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 came into the, you come into the world from the most ignoble way, from a smelly drop, and you end up in a way that you don't even want to contemplate, right? He says, this is, this, this is who you are. That, in, that's, one second, that, that, hold, 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 hold. that's Musar. So Musar is, till today, still studied it, there are yeshivot who focus on Musar that, that spend hours a day focusing on that the way we're going to become elevated spiritual beings is to realize that what houses our spiritual soul is a corrupt, worthless body and we shouldn't give in to it. We should realize where we come from and where we're going. And if we hammer that message again and again into our minds, then we will never come to a point where we, we have pride or we think anything of ourselves. That's one method. Then there's the opposite method. There's the, there's the opposite method where you go, to a, you go to a person and you say, instead of saying how the body is worthless, you talk about how you have a soul. The soul is infinite. Yes, you may not be living up to it, but every person, God gave them a soul. The fact that God gave them a soul, even if it's housed in a smelly putrid drop that's going to be eventually eaten by maggots, right? But during that time, God says, I'm in, a, in this crazy container that God gave us, I put in the most precious thing, I gave you a soul. And by focusing on what a person can achieve in the years that God gives us to live in this world, however many years it is, what we can achieve during that time, and playing to the aspiration and the potential is saying, rather than focusing on what you're not doing and why you're bad, and that you can't help yourself. You know why you're bad? Because your body is bad, right? Your, your physical, your, your whole physical, all your, all, everything about you is decrepit. What do you expect? But we talk about how you can, you can aspire to be great because of the soul that you have, despite the limitations of your body, it's a, it's, we, we're asking people to don't spend time thinking about negativity. Don't spend time thinking about what you cannot do, what you can't accomplish because of. Think about what you can do. Education throughout history, these are the, the two types of how teachers struggle, right? But there's, 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 there's basically two methods of education. You can, you can tell someone that he's failing and therefore he has to do better because he's, a, he's failing and if he doesn't, he doesn't pass, He's going to be a failure, and his whole, his whole life will be a failure, and he won't get a good job, and if he doesn't pay attention in school, and because he's dozing off, and because of this and that and that, right? And so you hammer and hammer and hammer, right, to change them. Or you take them aside and say, listen, the way we're going to change is not by accentuating and focusing on what you're doing wrong. But I'm going to tell you what you can be doing better, what you can do right. And to say... To only to, to use positive reinforcement, even though I know that there's a lot of negativity there as well, but you're not, we're not going to change people's uh, opinion of themselves. We're just gonna keep reinforcing it if we tell them how stupid they are or how inadequate they are. But there's a method of education to too. For some people, some people in order for them to, to study better, for them to grow, they need a kick in the pants. They need someone, right, if you, there's two types of coaches, right? If you, if you, whether it's in sports 
or in business, is the coach that yells at you, gets in your face and says, you're doing it all wrong. You're doing it all wrong, right? And some people need that frontal, right? And then you have coaches who put their arm around you and say, you know, if that opportunity presents itself again, you should try to do this a little better, a little differently than last time because if you do it this way, you can have a different result. Is, is one way right and one way wrong? Different people respond differently. So sometimes only positive reinforcement, right? Creates spoiled, entitled kids. Only, only uh, negative reinforcement can create depression and, la and lack of value and self-worth in people. It's balance. But overall, Hasidic teaching tells us that histor in, in his historically, people were able to respond better to criticism and to change through negative reinforcement. Today, we look, it says that today, the way we get people to change is by highlighting the potential for them to be great rather than the from telling them that the lowliness of man and what man can descend to, can, uh, that man can be worse than an animal if he's not careful, doesn't work on today's population anymore. It had a, there was a time, right, that that was a method of education. Why do I bring this up? I didn't forget about you. Just hold on to your thought for a second. I don't need to ask. Huh? I don't need to ask. Okay. So, because what he's telling, what he's saying here is that the whole, the, the, the notion of what these spies wanted was that to remain in an idealized version without distraction, without competition, they wanted to have a simple life that's going to be static, the way it is. What does God want? God created the world. Before the God created the world, he says, everything was perfect. Why, why did God create? Why mess up something that's good? Why did God put people in this world? You think God doesn't know that people are going to mess up more times than they get it right? That people are going to fail more times than they succeed? What's the point of creation? The point of creation was that God wanted to create the possibility that when, when people succeed, it is greater that one time that they succeed, one out of 10, makes all the nine times of failure worth it. That the light that overcomes darkness is much more powerful than just the light that's never been challenged by darkness before. And so, God wants us to go into, God wants us to go into the land of Israel, but God wants us to take the value system of Torah, which he gives us in the desert, in an idealized state, without competition, without distraction, and he says, now I want you to take that utopia and bring it into a complicated world. I want, I want, I want, to, I want, you, to, I want you to live up to a perfect ideal in a world that's gray, that's not black, that's not black and white. And this is the mission that God gave us. God, God wants us to do, God said that this, the land of Israel is ground zero for that experiment. That we can take that land and take Torah, which is absolute, has absolute truth, absolute values, and bring it into a world and influence that world that while we're working, remain honest. In the desert, there was no temptation to be dishonest because what do you have to be dishonest about? No one's buying or selling anything. I don't need to be dishonest because everything I have everything that I need. But then, well, then, what, then why have laws in the Torah about being dishonest if there's never a temptation to be dishonest? You know, it's, it's, uh, you know I'm going to finish with this one point, then we'll, we'll talk. It's in, a, it's in similar vein. We learned this on Shavuot that the, the, the Talmud tells us that when Moshe came up to heaven to receive the Torah, it says the angels told God, "What are you giving the Torah to Moshe for? You know what they're going to do? They're going to mess it up. Keep the Torah in heaven." The Torah is so pure, it's so precious, it's the most important thing. Are you going to give it, you going to, give it to, 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 those, to those rejects down there? You know what they're going to do? So God tells Moshe, you have a response? So Moshe says, sure, I have a response. He says, it says in the Torah, do not covet. He, he asks the angels, do you ever get jealous sometimes? So if you, don't, if you never get jealous, you're an angel. Then what do you need a Torah that tells you don't get jealous? Do you have parents? It says, honor your parents in the Ten Commandments. If you have no parents, what do you need a commandment for? It tells you to honor your parents. And he goes on and on. He goes, the whole purpose of the Torah is obviously that to be observed and to be perfected in a, in a situation where it's not easy. Because it's not always easy 
to idealize what Torah wants to do. To not be jealous, to be honest, to be respectful, to honor. The Torah, the Torah says all of these things, knowing full well that people are people. And so what is the Torah telling us? The Torah is telling us that it's obvious that the whole purpose of Torah can only be actualized in a place outside of a desert. There's no, there's no, there's no purpose of Torah in a desert. We're just a bunch of puppets sitting in a desert studying theory. Because how are you going to observe the Torah in a desert? How are you going to give tithes? How are you going to, give, how are you going to support the poor? There are no poor people in the desert. Right? How are you going to, how are you going to deal with charity? All the, so many bases of the Torah can only be realized when we are in a place where I have a choice to make. And, I'm, and we insist that Torah's absolute values, even in a relative world where all the nations that, we, that live around us are not observing Shabbat, it's easy to keep Shabbat in the desert. Nowhere to go, nothing to do. Just sit around and read all day, right? But this is the idea that, 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 that God says Torah is meaningless if you're not going to take it, bring it into the purpose of what this whole journey has been about. Your journey did not begin at Egypt. It began with creation of the world. I created the world. Why did I create a world? I created an imperfect world because the Torah is the antidote to making an imperfect world a perfect world. And that was our mission. The spies said that that's, that's what they were afraid of. They weren't afraid of Israel, the land. They were afraid of what it's going to do to us as spiritual people. It, it's going to devour us and make us like everybody else. And they said, you know what? Why do we have to, be, why, why do, we have to do that? Let's stay where we are. And so it's, it's a, it was a tug of war between being a nomadic um, tribe of people who were going to be sitting and doing meditation the whole day and living out in the wilderness versus what God intended for us to be, complicated people living in a, in a land and creating a system where, we're going to, where, where we have to impart Torah values into a very, very complex society and an imperfect world. And when we do, that's the ultimate purpose. Now, how that works and why God wants that and how can these people make, if that's, how can these people make such a drastic mistake? He gets into that too. But this is, this is how he looks at the story and says that we can't just write it, we, we read the story and you say, oh, silly, silly, right? But it's, it's we're to, he says, we're talking about people who are so profoundly spiritual that they couldn't, to them, giving up that, la that life was so devastating, right? It was so devastating for them to give up Moses, giving up that life in the desert of studying Torah all day. That's the, that's, and that's the most important thing is, is studying Torah. Who cares about all the mitzvot that we cannot do? Who cares that in the desert you can't, you can't you know, uh, do one mitzvah after another? But God says, Torah is a, is a, is a, is, is a Torah of mitzvot. And you cannot do mitzvot in the desert. Mitzvot have to be done in Israel, in the world. And this is where God saw that they were, what, what was actually happening was a rebellion against his purpose of creation, against the purpose of what he wanted us to be as a Jewish nation. And this is, this is why it was such a terrible calamity. So, yeah. So in today's world, when we didn't have a chance to, to be in this Ethiopia, that we are fully spiritual and... Um, before we're thrown into this material world, um, we didn't have a chance to become fully spiritual. Mm -hmm. But we have to deal with this overwhelming material world. Without the tools. From the get-go, right. yeah. Um, it's, a great it's a great question. It's a great question. I don't know if many of you remember, this, this, one of the brilliant ideas of this because the, 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 the Arizal talks about it, the Shalab talks about it, and Rabbi Shirazama talks about it. The stories of the Torah are very cyclical. In other words, the, the way the, the cyclical means, it's not, it's not a circle, they're concentric circles, circles within circles. These themes are happening in macro and micro to, <laughs> forms throughout the Torah. Do you know that, that way back in, we, we I'm, I'm just bringing this up for two minutes because you, uh, to also to highlight how he does this with every single story of the Torah to find that there's an idealized spiritual, spiritual battle that's going on in every story that is not obvious in the actual story. 
So one of the, the one of the famous story, one of the tragic stories of Genesis is the dispute between Joseph and his brothers. Right, the, the brothers are jealous of Joseph. He has these dreams, and what do they do? They throw him into a pit. They want to kill him, which actually begins the whole saga of Egypt because they sell him to Egypt. That's why they have to go down to Egypt. Great people. They can't get a, it, Okay, we've heard of everybody had the sibling rivalry. It's not a new thing, but to the extent. We, we, these are the these are the greatest. They want to kill the brother because of a few dreams, right? They can't get along. And here again, we see so many of the same stories. Jacob sends Joseph to his brothers, right? He, even though he knew what was going on, why would he put them in? Why would he put Joseph in that in that situation? He, Jacob was the one who actually puts Joseph in the precarious position. He sends them to the brothers, even though he knows the brothers hate them. And, so he actually threw them, threw them into the lion's den. In the same sense that Moshe knew what the spies would be doing, he sends them anyway. So what, are the, so the class, what he writes there is that what was happening between Joseph and his brothers was not a jealousy of brothers. It was a spiritual clash. The brothers felt that Joseph... Sorry. Joseph felt that his brothers were the equivalent of the generations of the spies. Why, why did the brothers hate Joseph so much? Because what were Joseph's dreams about, he writes? Joseph's dreams were about power, right? Are you gonna, are the stars and the moon are bowing down and the world, or the world binding sheaves and the, and the sheaves are bowing down. And Joseph was the first Jew who was what we would call a cosmopolitan Jew. Because remember, up until then, what, what were the prophet, what, what, did, what, did, what was Abraham? What was Jacob? What was Isaac? They were all shepherds. What were, the, what, were the, what were the 12 tribes? They were shepherds. When they came down to Egypt, and Joseph tells his brothers, if Pharaoh asks you, what do you guys do for a living? Tell him you're shepherds. Because if not, he's going to put you in the military, he's going to ruin your life. Just tell him the truth, tell him you're shepherds, that's all you know. You're shepherds, your father's a shepherd, your grandfather's always shepherds, right? Why were they shepherds? They, 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 they were not, they were not capable of doing anything else besides being a shepherd. The answer is that a shepherd is, lives a life of isolation. He doesn't live in, they don't live in cities. They live out in the countryside, and they have time to think. They sit on rocks. The sheep do whatever they do. You have a whole day to yourself. What do you do? You pray for many hours. You can study Torah a whole day. You're away from the noise. You're away from the hubbub of society. And it's a life of, it's a, it's a life of isolation. The tribes felt that the only way to remain pure, the only way to, way to remain and not become corrupted by society is you, have, you can't live in societies. You have to live and live. Being a shepherd gives you plenty of time to do all the davening and all the studying you want. What does Joseph say? Joseph says no. What kind of Judaism is that? To live, to build walls around yourself, to live in fear that my value system is inferior and that I'm gonna get corrupted? No. What is Judaism if it's not, if the whole purpose is not to be a light unto the nations and to influence society? The Torah is not just meant to be internal. Torah's message is, it's a world message to change the world. So Joseph says, where's the center of the world? It's Egypt at that time, right? Joseph says, you think it's incompatible to be Jewish and be a politician, to be incompatible to be Jewish and be and, and, and lead a nation at the same time? And they said, are you out of your mind? To be a rabbi and a statesman, to take Judaism and take it to the most depraved society on earth, Egypt at that time, it was a spiritual struggle. They felt that what Joseph was doing was he was destroying the legacy of Abraham. That Abraham came from Baghdad. Abraham, Abraham gave it all up to go to the land of Israel to become a new type of person, to become a Jew. And what is Joseph doing? He's reversing that whole thing and he's saying, no, I'm gonna, we're, we're going to go back to that society of idol worshiping and we're going to see if Torah's experiment is that you can be, be a Jew and that instead of being influenced, be the influencer. Remain strong wherever you are. And not be afraid that if, unless I'm living in a, special kind of, in a specialized community or in a cocoon or in a place that I'm not going to be tantalized, then, because that's, 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 that's what we would call Jewish weakness, right? It means that you are un, you're not sure that what you have is as strong as the allure of whatever of, 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 of the society out there. 
So the, but the, the brothers felt that Joseph is a rebel. He's a spiritual rebel. He's tearing down what the Abraham gave his life for, what Isaac and Jacob, what they, what they established was to create a new type of spiritualized nation. Shepherds, we're going to be shepherds forever. And Joseph says, no, that's not who we are. That's not what it means, means to be a Jew. <clears throat> so who's right, Joseph or his brothers? The answer, he writes, is they're both right. But it depends on when. You have to have a, a foundation of a shepherd. Joseph was right that eventually you have to evolve and take Torah into the world. But if you have no foundation, then, then what are you teaching? You're going you're, 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 you're to be, you can become the student before you can become a teacher. So he, he writes, that's why the, what, what the, the, the arc of history is that the tribes, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had to spend years fortifying their own foundation of what it means to be a Jew first. After you spend some years being a shepherd and creating a foundation, a strong foundation of what it means to be a Jew, then God says, now I want you to go on a journey. I want you to take that message and take, show that you're not going to be compromised by wherever you're going to be in the world. Think about how that story is so similar to the story. What does God do with the Jewish people? He keeps them isolated for a period of time where they can become inculcated with Torah. And after a certain period of time, he says, now you're strong enough to take that message in this, into a, and build a society around it. But, but, but you have to have the foundation first. But if you're already in the complicated material world, how do you have the foundation? If, I'm sorry? If you're already in this complicated world, how do you build the foundation? Because you can't get out of this world. And, but when so, you're already in it... Right, so he, he, they write, he writes, that this is why we spend, before you, before you move to San Francisco, you have to spend a few, you got to, you got to live, you got to go to yeshiva for a number of years. I mean, what, 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 what is, I'm, 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 not, I'm not being cute about it. The idea is, is that if you don't have an anchor, it is, it's very difficult. Because if you're trying to learn and navigate at the same time, it's hard. And that's why there's no substitute for taking a certain period of time and being immersed in a world of learning. And then, you, you, just like you can't go to medical school and operate at the same time, you have to take a certain period of time to immerse yourself and educate yourself without distraction. There, there, there is an element that which is the system that we go through, that I you know, that you have to spend a certain amount of the time, that, that it sends, it's almost like an inoculation, where, whereas that no matter where you're gonna go, where, wherever you're gonna be dropped in the world, right, you can live to your value system, whether you're in San Francisco, you're in Thailand, or you're in Israel, right? So my outlook and the way I would behave doesn't change wherever I am, if I'm in Jerusalem or San Francisco, because that value system is born out of Torah. And I know and I'm positive, I believe, that Torah's message, Torah's life guide, doesn't change with geography. Its message is equal, it's everywhere. So um, it, that, it builds an imperviousness that, that we, we're working from the inside out. The question is, if we didn't have that opportunity to have a certain number of formative years of learning a certain worldview from the Torah's perspective, and to be able to to have a foundation where you can feel that I can take that value system wherever I go, and I won't feel threatened, and I won't feel diminished, well, is not easy to do when you haven't had an opportunity in in, in your early lifetime to do it. I, I I understand that, but at the same time, the Torah tells us that if it, if we have a rich history of numerous people who have been able to accomplish that later on in life too. It doesn't have to happen when you're a teenager or when you're in primary school. Rabbi Akiva and Reish Lakish and some of the greatest giants of Jewish history took the time at some point in their life to say, I'm going to take a certain period of time to, do, to immerse myself in a desert. If I want to be able to survive and become an Israeli and still keep Torah, I have to I have to discover Torah outside Israel first, in a sense. I have to be, I, got, I, got to put, I have to be in the desert. I have to be a shepherd for a certain period of time before I can go to an Egypt and remain Joseph. Because had Joseph not been a shepherd before and gone straight to Egypt, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have survived as a Jew. 
He had to have a foundation for which he would be strong wherever, wherever he'd be. So there is no substitute. There is no substitute that wherever, as much as studying as you can. Now, no one's suggesting you can't stop and just go somewhere. But there's no, there is no substitute for taking a certain period of time. It's like it could be a couple of months. But dedicated, devoted study to, to explore what does it mean to be a Jew, to study the text, to study, our, to study what, how Torah expects us to, be, to live. And once we get that, I believe it gives us a certain amount of, a certain amount of strength to be able to go to any society. You know, says, I get, I, I get, you know, San Francisco, there's no Judaism in San Francisco. So, so was there, were there Jews in Israel when the Jews went into Israel 3,000 years ago? Were there Jews in the desert? When the Torah is timeless. It's stateless. It's ge there's no geography around it. So it shouldn't matter where you are in the world. If, if we can, it could be one person, and it could be a million people. You can be in a society of a million people who are practicing Judaism, and you don't because you don't feel connected to it. And you can be one in a million. Who, why? Because Torah was given to us before we came to Israel. It exists outside of time and outside of space. That is, this, that is the real reason why the Torah was given to us in the desert and before we came to the land of Israel. We shouldn't associate it with Israel or geography or time. It stands alone. So, at any point in time, when a person realizes that I'm at a point in life where I want to know more about who I am, what my soul is like. I know where I came from, as Akavya says, I know where I'm going to end up. But I, want, I, don't want to focus, I don't want to focus on smelly drops and worms and maggots. I want to focus on how I can transform the time that I have to become something special, to, to, to utilize that life that God gave me, that from, from becoming, starting from nothing and ending nothing, God says you can become a, a spiritual, you can become a giant, you can change that world that God created. Take that time. There's no, and if, if, if the opportunity presents itself that you can, that to go to a place where you study uninterrupted for a certain period of time, whether it's weeks or it's months, there are many people who take the opportunity at some point in their life and they'll go to a yeshiva for adults for six months to a year. That is such, it, it, you, I, you, can't, you can't even quantify what that experience is. It's going into a different world, stepping out of the world, going into a desert for six months and then re-engaging it's like literally going from the desert back into Israel. It's going from, 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 from the, being a tribal, from the, the, the tribe, and becoming a Joseph. And it gives you the tools not to, to look at the world, not as a reality and the Torah as an abstract, but the Torah as my backbone is what it, what it is. And the world that I have to, has to, have to, I have to, I have to navigate my world through the lens of Torah, not vice versa. So it's what we start with. Um, but I, again, that's what but is 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 uh, not everybody has the same opportunity. Not everybody grew up the same way. True, however, the, Torah, the same Torah tells us that whenever we get to that point where we realize that we want to make, we, we want, we want to, we have the ability to sit and to study, whether it's an hour an evening, two hours an evening, one hour a week, whatever that time is, make that. The time that you're going to engage, and that that becomes your oasis, that becomes your desert, that becomes your shepherd life, and then for, for, during that time, you're, there is no world, there's no San Francisco, there's nothing, there's only the Torah, and then when I re-engage, it's a different perspective. I say, okay, what, how does the Torah inform my life? Not how 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 am I going to keep some of these mitzvot with the complexity of with my of my career, you're starting from the wrong angle, right? It's like it's like it's like I'm an Israeli Jew, right? It's um, but it makes no difference whether you have people who were born into that world, people who came to that world, or people who are coming learning it as adults. Um, everybody has to find, even people who grew up in that world have to keep, time and time again, take that time to step back and always evaluate whether or not I'm losing the perspective 
of being a desert Jew or am I a city Jew? What, I mean, it's, it's a value system. And um, I, they, say that, they say that Golda Meir was, was uh, I told you this before, we'll finish with this. So anyway. <coughs> Sorry, no voice left. Um, it, was a, it was a critical time when, when Golda Meir was appealing to Henry Kissinger to, to, to send relief and to send arms to Israel during the Yom Kippur War. And so she wrote to him, it was, a, it was the desperate times, and she wrote to him that, you know, um, you have to remember that you're a Jew, and Henry Kissinger was a Secretary of State, but he, he was a German Jew. So she appealed to, to his, to his Jews, says, you're, the, the state of Israel is desperate. So she said, you know, help your people. So he wrote back to her, he says, I want you to know, with all due respect, that, number one, I'm an American. Number two, I work for the American people. Number three, I'm a citizen of the world. Number four, I happen to be Jewish. And she wrote back, that's great, because in Hebrew we read from left to right. <laughs> from, sorry, from right to left. <laughs> so, if, if um, the secular model is, is that our identity is cultural, right? If you're, are you an Israeli, I'm an American, I'm a this, I'm a citizen of the world, that happens to be Jewish, or does my world start with, I'm a Jew? That happens to be, I have other, I have other characteristics, I have other attributes. You can be an Israeli, you can be an American, you can be a diplomat, you can be a career person. All those things are true, but that's not where we start from, right? So I'm not trying to fit Torah into my, into my world. I'm trying to fit my world into my identity as a Jew. It's where we're starting from. And so Joseph's perspective was that as long as you have somewhat of a foundation, then you have, you have an obligation to go and to, to share that with the world. Don't be a, don't be a fearful Jew. Engage. Because if you're, if, you're, if you're a strong Jew, then you'll be successful, and people will respect who you are, and you don't have to be afraid. If you live in fear all the time, that if, I, if I'm not living behind a, a ghetto, I'm not living behind a wall, and my value system is inferior to the other value systems of the world, and that the only way, and, and there are many Jews who feel that way, with all due, with God bless them, there are people who build those walls. Many of them live in these Jewish communities, and they feel, for, 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 and for, the, for many people, they feel, they feel that way about themselves, that they need to inoculate themselves because if they let the vapor in from the outside, it's going to, it's going to change them. But the Rebbe and his, his four beers and the Hasidic masters felt very, and felt very strongly that the sin of the spies was just that. That they wanted to keep Torah to themselves and forget, shun the world. Let, the world can go to hell, as they say. The world, it's great. The world's, it's not my problem, right? My problem is my family and, and I, want to, I want to preserve my spiritual identity so I'm going to stay in the desert, right? The tribes say, let's stay where we are. Who cares about what's going on outside the world around us? God says no. God says, Torah is only as important as what you're going to do with the Torah out. Study it well. Internalize it. Become saturated with it. But then that's not enough. You can't spend your whole life in a yeshiva studying by yourself. That's not, that's not the idealized version. It's great for a certain, certain period of time of your life. But if you're not taking it and sharing it, and you're not actualizing it in your day-to-day -day life with people, it's a failure. The whole Torah, the whole, the whole journey is, is worthless. So, who's right? God, this, God himself is telling us what he wants us to do. So what, what do we, we're going to be smarter than God, more religious than God. We're going to, that, that we're going to say, no, we need to sit in yeshiva and a kolo, we're going to, or live in a, build a, a Jewish community, we're not going to, so we're not going to have any influence because all we want to do is study Torah all day. There's a world out there and what I'm saying is, the opposite of the secular world, the religious world has its, it's still living, it still has its spies, right? There are communities in Israel, communities in New York, in Chicago, in LA, who still are tribes and spies. They're still saying that Torah is only going to survive if we build a circle around it. And then the, and, the, and, and 
year and year. When I, when I, the Rebbe said, how do we not get the message from the story? The whole, the whole purpose of the story is that, that God says, what's the point of Torah if the world doesn't know about it? What's the point of Torah if it's not being used to be, to, to, to be lived in a society that the world that God created and showing how Torah and the world are not opposites, they're not mutually exclusive, they work together. And so this is, that's the product of where I grew up in, right? But it's, it's, what I'm saying is it's not unanimous in the Jewish world, right, that the spies were wrong. There are many Jews who, who want to live that way still today. So the, the, the leaders of the tribes uh, wanted to stay in the desert, right, for those reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but it then seems like the people wanted to go back to Egypt. Was there a spiritual meaning of that or, or did they want to stay in the desert too? So, uh, so the, the implication is is that they knew that God would not allow the status quo to be. So the, the choice was Egypt or Israel. Who, who it, knew it, that? It, I'm sorry. If it, because you asked me why do they want to go to Egypt? Back to Egypt and not what? Well, it's two things, I'm sorry. The, you have it seems the whole people of Israel want to go back to Egypt. Is that in, in contradiction or in contrast to their, their tribal leaders, the, the spies who want to stay in the desert? Or is it, is it a trichotomy or dichotomy? Egypt, desert, Israel, or? So Rashi brings down a couple of interpretations about what was going on. But they're, they're, they, they, wanted to, they wanted to depose Moses and create a new leader. Because Moshe was telling them to go to Israel. Even though he knew that it would be his own demise. Because he said, that's what God wants. If that's what God wants, what I want is immaterial. So the Jewish people said, we'd rather go back to Egypt to a land of worshipping idols than worshipping than worshiping God who wants us to compromise on our value system. So Rashi quotes a number of interpretations. It says, it says, let us appoint the leader. Because it says, let us appoint the head and return to Egypt. When you have to appoint the head, you have a head. The head was Moses. He said, no, this Moses is not good. Why? Because he doesn't, even Moses doesn't understand what, what needs to happen. Moses is acting against his own self-interest. So let's get a new leader. Um, but the, um, certainly the people, the nation, were following the lead of their leaders, right? So, but it's, 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 it is something, there, there is, a, I can't go into tonight, there, there, there is an involved discussion about how can it be that they would prefer to go back to Egypt where they were persecuted, killed, humiliated, how is that a, a, a preference than going forward to an unknown? The unknown is unknown. What you, what you escaped from was hell, right? Oh, different, different. Anyway, but that's but that's just a different way, a different examination of the story. To where, where it still leaves with questions, but the point is, it gives it it, it it gives credit to the idea that what's happening here is it's not a petty discussion of whether or not we're just afraid to fight or we want to give up our mana. It's a whole philosophical outlook of how we want to live our lives and what the future of the Judaism should be. Should the future of Judaism be? a hermetical nation living in, in, in isolation, separate from the world, living Torah, or does, does the idealized form of Judaism necessitate being, living in an open society and, and not being afraid to test Judaism's values against the, the local values of the society? All right.